Good morning, guys. As Brian shared, my name is Phil, and we are starting a new series. It's all about identity. And to start it off, I want you to think of a phrase. I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase, let me see what you're made of. Uh, if you've heard that phrase, maybe it takes your mind to certain places. For me, there's two things I think of. One, I believe that's what my dog thinks every time we introduce a new stuffed animal, that right away she's like, let me see what you're made of, and she plans to figure that out. The other is athletics. My mind just goes to athletics. I think about the concept of that, that phrase, really picturing your grit, your perseverance, your ability to endure. What are you going to do when you find yourself in the tough moments of competition or where your back is against the wall? Those kind of concepts come to my mind. And I was thinking, I had a great conversation. I was able to meet with one of my friends who's a little older in, in life, a little further down the road. He's old school, definitely. And he was sharing some stories with me about his, his uh, years in basketball. Now, this guy was a stud. Um, he, he had a 50-point game before the three-point line ever existed. So that tells you how old school he is, but also tells you how much of a stud he is. He averaged 32 points in college per game. I mean, he was just a great athlete. And he was telling me the story that when he got out of college, he started working at this school. And the school was, they just had a losing program when it came to basketball. And they had, they had accepted that. They became a school that just accepted losing. And so he was at practice for a week or so, and he noticed the boys just didn't have the effort. They were goofing off a lot. So he, he got to the point where he just grew tired of it. And he told the boys, he said, I just want you to run. Just run around the gym. You don't stop running until I tell you to stop running. And if you stop running, you can hit the locker room. You could change your clothes. You can call your parents. They could pick you up because you're off the team. So they started running and running and running. And eventually, one of the young guys asked him, he said, Coach, are you serious? While still running, mind you, are you serious? If we stop running, you'll kick us off the team. He said, I'm, I'm dead serious. Keep running. And they ran for about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes until he finally said, okay, you could stop running. But they changed their demeanor. And all of a sudden, the program shifted. They got focused. All of a sudden, he started to sort of dig into what they were made of. It makes me think of a few years ago, a friend of mine set me up with a trainer for two months. His name was Dan Hannum. And Dan was a collegiate wrestler, and then he, for a little period of time, went off to fight uh, mixed martial arts, like the UFC type of thing. He did that. And he would put me through these things called gauntlets. And I think his goal was to see what I was made of in my mid-30s. And he would put me through these things called gauntlets where you had 10 moves. The first move was usually, usually some sort of cardio. You would do that, take a 30 to 60 second break. Then you would do that again, add a second move. Take a 30 to, second, 30 to 60 second break. Do that again, second move, third move. And he would go all the way like that for 10 moves. So by the time you got to the end of it, you had done that first thing 10 times, but he just kept stacking it. And I had never been at a point in my, my life where I've exer exercised where I actually thought I might throw up, like literally thought I might throw up. He took me there almost every single time I worked out with him. I thought that he really wanted to see what I was made of. But here's the reality. Those things might be great motivators, but they're poor indicators of what we're really made of. They don't really reveal who we are. My friend Larry, who I spoke with, he's now much older in life. He suffers from Parkinson's disease, and the things that he used to be able to do, he can't do anymore. And I think about where I'm at in my life, and I go on Sunday afternoon, sometimes I play at a league at the Body Zone, and I play against guys who are literally, I used to just say it, but now they are literally half my age. The kid guarding me last week was half my age. I was joking with Brian a few weeks ago. I said, I can't wait till I hit the 40 and over league. I feel like I'm going to dominate the 40 and over league. He said, that's a phrase no man has said ever in their life. I can't wait till I get to the 40 and over league. Those things, just, they're not clear indicators of who we actually, actually are. Because what happens when we reach a place that we can't do those things anymore, if that's what defined me, then who am I? If I'm defined by what I could do and I can't do any longer, then who am I? If I'm defined by what I have and I no longer have, then who am I? Here's the truth that I want us to capture this morning. It's that I cannot know who I truly am 
until I know who made me. I can't know what I'm made of until I know the one who made me. And my identity is not found in the things that I have, the things that I do, the things that people say and think about me. My identity is found in the one who designed me and created me. We recognize that this concept is so powerful. James, our student ministry director, and I have had conversations time and time again about identity. Because for both of us, many, many years were wasted trying to find one. Trying to get people to see us as something or to have something to be recognized as something. There were so many years of my life, so much wasted money, wasted effort. I found myself in places I didn't want to be doing things I didn't want to do with people I didn't want to be with because I needed some identity. And it wasn't until later in life that we realized that it was God who defines us. And in understanding that, it created this freedom from the rat race of identity. And if we don't find where our true identity comes from, we will spend the rest of our lives trying to be defined by what we have, what we do, what we know, what we look like, or what other people say and think about us. But none of those things determine what you're made of. The one who made you determines what you're made of. So Brian and I started studying and we came across this letter that was written to an early church in the city of Colossae. A church in the Roman Empire, which is actually, it was located in what is modern day Turkey. And the, the argument of, and the push of his letter is to help them understand their identity, to keep them from chasing after false identities. Here's a man who had defined himself by being a great religious leader for the Jewish people. Here's a man who was so zealous to to have that identity that he actually fought against the church, tried to destroy Christianity as, as it was growing and building up. Until one day, Jesus presents himself to Paul. Paul's whole life is transformed, and he goes from seeking the approval of men to seeking and living under the approval of God. And he writes this letter to a group of Christians believers in Jesus Christ who were being challenged to find identity somewhere else. Individuals who had believed in Christ, but they were being told that that's not enough. If you really want to be great, here's what you need to do. You need to reach higher levels of enlightenment. There were others who were telling them, if you really want to be great, you need to keep the Jewish traditions and laws. And others would say, you need to reach a level of spirituality where you can pray to angels. And Paul would speak to them in this letter and say, no, Jesus is enough. He is above all. He is the very fulfillment of God. All things are held together in him. All things are found in him. All things are created by him. He's not an addition to. He is everything. There is nothing else needed to define you, to make you who you are. If you have found Jesus Christ, you have found what you need to find. And he will argue through this letter, this concept to show them that once we know the one who made us, we can understand who we are. And it drastically changes. As we go through this series, what you'll see is that understanding drastically changes our interactions with everybody else. And that will be the progression of his letter. But what he calls them to understand and what he calls us to understand is that what we are made of is not found in anything else. It's found in the one who made us. Guys, you and I are not self-made. We are not man-made. We are not even American-made. We are God-made. We are grace-made. We are gospel-made. Paul will argue that, and I want to go into that letter, Colossians chapter 1, and I want to show you Paul's argument that we are not those things, we are God made. In his introduction, he makes some powerful statements, and we might glance over this, when we read New Testament letters, we might glance over the introduction, but there's an, an importance to it. When Paul would introduce himself, he would often set up the letter, or the argument of the letter in his introduction. So when he writes to the Corinthians who are being taught that he doesn't really have any kind of authority to speak to them, he says, Paul, an apostle, a called one of God. He establishes his authority from the beginning. When he writes to the Galatians who are being challenged to 
push aside the good news of Jesus Christ and adopt a new message, he writes to them and says, Paul, an apostle, set not by man or the will of man, but by the will of God, to establish with them that his message did not come from him. It's not some man-made message. And here, he writes to the Colossians, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. What he's stating to them is his existence, his calling, his standing existed because of God. He was not man-made. He was not self-made. He did not transform himself. He was God-made. Galatians chapter 1, as he writes to the Galatians and challenging them on adopting a false gospel, he says to them that he did not come with a message that he received from man, but rather a message he received directly from Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say that God set him apart, called him from his mother's womb. Before he even knew what a message was, God set him apart to be a messenger. And guys, while he's speaking about himself as an apostle, I believe his statement there applies to every single one of us. Your parents made you, or they were a part of the process, but it was God who truly made you. When God created the first man, he breathed life into him. And it is that same God, when you were conceived in the womb of your mother, who breathed life into you. He made you. He created you. And even if we ignore or deny that very truth, the reason I exist today is because I am God-made, not man-made, not self-made, not anything else. I love how the theologian William Barclay puts it. He says here, right at the outset of the letter, is the whole doctrine of grace. A man is not what he has made himself, but what God has made him. There is no such thing as a self-made man. There are only men whom God has made and men who have refused to allow God to make them. We can get caught up with this perception that my identity is self-made. It is not. Who you are is made by the one who made you. You are God-made. You are grace-made. He goes on in his introduction, after introducing himself, he speaks out to those who he's writing to. And he gives a, a common introduction that in every single letter, if you read through the New Testament, every single letter Paul writes, he gives this introduction, grace and peace to you. The word grace, it literally means unmerited favor, the unmerited favor of God. It's the reception of something unearned and undeserved, peace is this concept, this inner confidence and rest which comes from knowing that we are peace in, at peace with the Father through Jesus Christ. Those things, grace and peace, we did not earn. The very concept of grace is unearned, unmerited favor. God gave us grace. God gave us peace through his son Jesus Christ when we were undeserving of it. He gave it to us while we were yet enemies hostile towards God. He gave us what we did not deserve. And as Paul writes to these Colossians, he says, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice that it's the grace of God that defines their very identity. He says, to the holy people, the set-apart people, the saints, what made them saints? What makes any of us saints holy? God's grace and God's grace alone. We did not earn that standing. God graciously gave it to us. And when I think about my identity and understand that I am grace made, have I made mistakes in my life? Absolutely. Have I failed and missed the mark? Have I sinned against a holy and righteous and just God? Absolutely. But that is not my definition. My definition is one of grace. I am now, through Jesus Christ, a holy one a set-apart one, a saint. That's the very label that God has given me. I think back in my life, and I think of individuals when I was a young man who maybe have never seen me since. They could say who they think that I am. 
But I am not defined by those failures. I am defined by the grace of Jesus Christ. And His grace offers me a new name. Somebody recently stopped in the office and they dropped a whole bunch of Max Lucado books. So I've been, I think there's like 20 Max Lucado books on my desk and I've been reading them like crazy. And I like him as an author. I love the stuff he's writing about. Right now I've been reading this book. It's called, And the Angels Were Silent. And in it he tells this story about a man named Edward O'Hare. And Edward O'Hare was a lawyer during the time of Al Capone. He actually was one of Al Capone's lawyers. And he knew the world of the mobster. He actually enjoyed some of the lifestyle of a mobster. He was a very wealthy man. He had a lot of success and a lot of success as our world would define it. He had a lot of experiences because of his ties to the mob. In fact, he understood how to rig races. So he would he would bet on races for dogs and he would be the one feeding the dog. So he would overfeed seven dogs and then bet on the eighth. So he would win all this money from the races because he rigged them. But then eventually, Edward decided that he was going to flip on Al Capone. And he was going to go speak to the authorities and give them all they needed to incriminate Al Capone, knowing what that would result in in his life. And two shotgun blasts later, Edward O'Hare never breathed another breath. Why would he do that? Well, Edward had a desire to give his son, Edward, Butch O'Hare, an opportunity for a new name. His son would go on to the military. He would enter the Navy, and he would become one of the first flying aces during World War II. He single-handedly would battle against nine bombers, take them down to save his, his airship and save all of their men. From that, he would, he would receive the first naval award or the first award of the Medal of Honor in the Navy during World War II. And later, he would give up his life fighting against torpedo bombers to protect his men. Now, if you today were to fly into Chicago, you may fly into O'Hare International Airport. Because a mobster one day decided that he didn't want the name O'Hare to be associated with mobsters. He wanted the name to be associated with heroes. So he flipped on Al Capone so his son could have a new name. When I consider what Jesus has done for me, he knew what it would cost. He knew what coming here would cost him. But he did it so that you and I could have a new name. So that you and I did not have to be defined by the mistakes and sins of our past, that we could be defined by the grace of Jesus Christ offered freely to us. He did it to give us a new name. We are God made, we are grace made, we are gospel made. And here's where I think Paul's argument just jumps off the pages. Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. He says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who has told us also of your love in the Spirit. Notice what he says. He says, we've heard of, we give thanks. Every time we pray to God, we give thanks because we've heard of your faith and your love for your faith in Jesus Christ, your love for all the brethren, which come or spring from or because of the hope that you have stored up for you in heaven from the gospel. Notice his argument. He says, we praise God, we thank God because you have faith. Your faithfulness is proven. You have love for all the brethren. And think about how massive that is. I, I could say I love a lot of God's people. 
But could I say I love all God's people? I mean, that's where they got to. The, they had love for all of God's people. And he says, where did it come from? You didn't go out and find it. You didn't go out and figure out how to be faithful or figure out how to be loving. It sprung forth. It was a product of the gospel. What Paul is arguing here is that their faith, their hope, their love were natural byproducts of their understanding of the good news of Jesus Christ. As Christians, here's what happens. We believe in Jesus Christ, the grace that he's offered us, and then we get in this mentality of, I have to now find a Christian identity. I have to now go figure out what it means to look like a Christian, to be a Christian, when the the starting point is the person of Jesus Christ himself. And he produces faith and love and hope. He says, out of this gospel, fruit has been produced. Here's the gospel, guys. You and I were designed perfectly in the eyes of God, created in his image. Our story did not start with broken. Too often we share the gospel and say, you're a sinner saved by grace. That's not where my story started. It's not where your story started. It started in a garden where God created man perfect, good, unique in the image of himself. It was when we chose to no longer treat him as God, but to be our own, broken came. When we said, God, I don't want you to be that for me. I will be my own God. We rejected the very source of life itself. We received not only physical death, but spiritual death, separation from God, who is life itself. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the just penalty for our sins. To die on a cross, but to come back to life, to give us an opportunity for new life. To be born again, as Jesus would say to a young religious leader named Nicodemus, to have a new opportunity, to have a change, a new identity. That's the gospel And Paul says, I thank God for your faith, for your love, for your hope that spring forth because of that very truth. It's that truth that produced those things in your life. He says, not only does it produce fruit, he says it produced fruit all over the world. This is not just some first like first world western gospel a message that we believe because it fits our context i've heard too often where people say the only reason you believe in jesus christ is because that's how you were raised it's the environment that you grew up in it's what you know it's what surrounded you well if that is true then why did a group of jewish men and women in the first century who were not raised that way who were not taught that way except not only that message but accepted in the face of contrast to the point of martyrdom. Why is it that in that same context, Roman men and women who learned and grew up in polytheism and worshipped so many gods that before they even exited their house, they had to appease certain gods, let alone all the gods that they had to appease out in the world. Why did they believe in that message? Why is it that men and women today in communists and Muslim countries accept Jesus Christ even if that acceptance means their imprisonment, their death, persecution? I read recently the statistics are showing that where the church is growing the fastest right now is Iran. And Afghanistan is a close second. This is a gospel message that is not Western. It didn't start with the Roman Catholic Church. It started with a group of Jewish individuals who saw a Jewish man who died and came back to life. And that message was so powerful and life-changing that they were willing to die for it. This is not only is it building fruit or producing fruit around the world, it produces fruit in your life. He looks at them and says the same as it has been doing in you since the day that you believed it or or heard it and understood it. 
And that word understood is not just, yeah, it makes sense to you. It's that you grabbed hold of it. From the day you grabbed hold of the gospel, from the day you accepted it and entrusted your life to it, it started producing something in you. It started changing you. And Paul's argument here is that we should pursue the producer, not the produce. What I don't want us to get caught up in is this idea that now that I've believed in Jesus Christ, if you're there, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, now I've got to figure out how to find a Christian identity. He is the identity. We pursue him. Brian's going to dive into this more next week. Paul will go on to pray. I pray that you would know him. I pray that your knowledge of him would grow. Because out of that fruit is produced. Jesus said this. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you stay connected to me, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. Eleven times in that segment, Jesus says, remain. Your job and my job is not to produce fruit. Our job is to remain. Our job is to connect ourselves to the producer. He'll produce the fruit. Paul writes in his letter to the Galatians, he says that if our job is to do that, the works of our flesh are all kinds of evil things. But he says, however... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's not work of self. It's not work of my own abilities or work of my flesh. It's the, the fruit of the Spirit. He produces. I pursue the producer. My, my goal, my longing in life should be to pursue the vine, not to pursue the fruit. If I pursue the vine, I believe this with all of my heart, if you're you're here this morning and you commit to know God, to search for him with everything in you, change will occur. I believe that. That if someone has a genuine pursuit of God, They want to know him. They want to be connected to him. They want to be close to him. If that's a genuine pursuit, change is inevitable. Fruit is inevitable. And think think about it this way. If you spend enough time with my seven-year-old son, Owen, he will bro you at some point. Man or woman, he will call you bro. It's bro this, it's bro that, it's bro everything. He bros everyone, and that's my bad. Because when I got into lifting, I turned this whole thing into like, this is the, hu- this is the identity now. So I would joke bro everything. I'd bro around the house. I would turn regular everyday words into bro. Like, hey, pass me the brotato chips. I would say that all the time. So now my son bros everyone. Because if you spend enough time with somebody, you start looking and sounding like somebody. If you pursue the vine, the producer, genuinely pursue him, you'll start looking like the producer. You'll start sounding like the producer. You'll start being like the producer. I don't chase the fruit. I chase the one who produces the fruit. I stood back on those stairs last week, and I watched as you guys worshipped. Creepy, I know. But I just watched, and I watched as people raised their hands, and I watched as people wept, and I watched as people almost lost sight of everybody else in the room, and it was just them and God. And you know what it did for me? It elevated my love for you, and it elevated my longing to see that more and more and more. Because when people see God, when people approach God, life change happens. I love watching the sick recovery guys here and the teen challenge guys here. And we had a group from from a a ministry down in Lancaster here last week. And a guy was like dancing in the aisle. And it was super awesome because there's something that I see there. What I see is that the gospel is not forgotten. 
what I see is that there's this understanding and a relevance of the good news of Jesus Christ. It made me think of a few years ago, I, I went down to New Orleans to preach at a mission with my friend. I had never preached before a more vocal audience. They gave me consistent cues as to whether I was doing a good job or not. Oh, that's a good word, brother. That's a good word. I'm like, okay, let's go. But what I realize is that when the gospel is front and center, when you understand, I desperately need you, God, it creates a reaction. And I'm not saying that those of us who have been in faith for many, many years have forgotten that or that we don't understand that, but sometimes we lose sight of it. And over time, we start thinking, oh, look at all the fruit that I produced and forget that we were nothing without Jesus Christ. And we had nothing without Jesus Christ. Maybe, just maybe, we need to go back to the gospel. Maybe we need to remember that we are gospel made, not self made. Understand where our true identity comes from. In the Old Testament, there was a man named Moses. He was a leader of the religious people, the Jewish people. Moses literally went into the presence of God. God descended upon a mountain. And Moses could go up that mountain, he would be enveloped in a cloud, and he would speak to God. And when he would come down, you ever have a -a glow-in-the-dark thing that you had to hold in front of the light for it to glow in dark? You had to put it on a light bulb or something. I've done that once. I had like these battle trolls. So if you're from the 90s or 80s, you had trolls. But if you're a dude, you couldn't just have the regular troll with the little gem in their stomach because that wasn't cool. You had to have a battle troll, so they're like... But they, were, they didn't move. And I had glow-in-the-dark ones. Their legs glow-in-the-dark. So I just sat one on the light bulb, only to later come back and see that it had melted and almost caught on fire. <laughs> Anyhow, that's beside the point. <laughs> Moses would go up into the mountain, and he would come down, and his face would literally shine. The people of Israel would say, Moses, go put on a veil, man. You got so much shine going on, we, we can't look at you. Here's a really cheesy phrase. You can't have the glow without the go. You can't look like Jesus without ever stepping into the presence of Jesus. Moses shone. His face would shine who God was because he went into the presence of God. Our pursuit in life, my heart for you through this whole series is that it would not be that we go searching for some identity. What am I, God? What should I be? What should I look like? But that we go searching for the one who identifies. That our lives would be consumed with knowing him. That our lives would be a push to be closer to him. So how do we do that? Here's the classic answers, but I'm going to give them anyhow because they're important. What you're going to hear, and Brian's going to touch on this more next week, read your Bible and pray. And we, we brush those off because they're classic answers. Oh, I've heard that all my life. Yeah, read your Bible and pray. The greatest revelation we have of God is the word of God. And so if I want to know God and understand him, I should go to the greatest revelation he's given me. But here's the approach that I want you to take. Not just, here's my Christian duty that identifies me as a Christian I read. I want you to go with a search. I want you to dive into God's word and say, God, show me yourself. And when you pray, God, show me yourself and show me me. When you're praying, God, man, I wish you would fix her. I wish you would fix him. They're so messed up. And all of a sudden, God starts saying, yeah, but what about you? Okay, thank you, God, for showing me. Let's talk about that. Show me yourself. Go with a search. Not just this Christian, oh, I'm going I'm to mark the box. I'm going to check it off. Go looking for God. And each and every day, Ask God to make it evident to you when you are trying to be self-made versus God-made, grace-made, gospel-made. Maybe some of the indicators will be 
that you're willing to do things, but only if they make you look really good. Only if they're not hard. Only if you actually feel like doing those things. Because often a God-made, grace-made, gospel-made individual will do the things that cause a lot of sacrifice. That cause a lot of discomfort. But being in the presence of God led them to somewhere they would not have gone on their own. What are you made of? You are made by the one who made you. You are God made. You are grace made. You are gospel made. Pursue him. And change is inevitable. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for the grace that you so lavishly poured out on us. I thank you that you take our old name, you cover it in the blood of the cross, and you offer us a new name through Jesus Christ. But I pray that if there's somebody here this morning who has been chasing all of their life to find some identity, Lord, I, I pray that today would be the day they will realize that identity is found in the one who made us, There's no other person in this world who can tell me who I am. I cannot tell me who I am. My deeds, my accomplishments, my failures, whatever it is, on any end of the spectrum, they do not define me. You alone define me. And I pray that if today is the first step for somebody draw close to you and know you, Lord, I pray that they would take that step to believe the gospel, to believe what you have done for them. Lord, I pray for many in this room who have been years and years and years and years stepping. They would take one more step closer to you to understand and know that they did not make themselves did not accomplish anything on their own. But you began producing fruit from the moment that they heard and understood the good news that you offered. Lord, keep producing that in us and give us a heart to pursue you and you alone. I pray this all in Jesus' name.